Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the um, March lecture in the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health uh, monthly lecture series. And as you can see on the screen that um, we're going to be hearing about exercise and aging from Dr. Phil Adis today. And uh, I'm really honored to have this opportunity uh, to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Phil Adis. But before I do that, just a couple uh, house cleaning um, um, matters. Uh, so this is going to be a one hour session. Um, we ask that you, we will have about maybe 40, 45 minutes of lecture and then questions. And so hold your questions. Well, you can send them. We want you to send them through the um, Q&A uh, button. And then um, we'll have time at the end to go through those. And um, with that, I think I'll just move into my introduction. So I said, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm really honored to have this opportunity. Um, as you can see, Phil will speak to the, us today on the important topic of exercise and aging. Um, that's a topic of considerable importance to the U.S. overall, but also Vermont population health. Um, we're on track to have more older adults than kids by the year 2025. So just think about that. Um, so Phil holds the Philip Adis um, Endowed Professorship in Cardiovascular Prevention here in the UVM's uh, Larner College of Medicine, where he's also Associate Director of our NIH-supported Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. Phil did his undergraduate uh, work at the University of Maryland, where he majored in zoology, while also playing Division I baseball as a catcher. So Phil comes to this uh, topic of exercise from multiple um, directions. From uh, the University of Maryland, he went on to the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, where he um, took a master's in exercise physiology, then back to Maryland, where he got his MD um, at the University of Maryland in, in Baltimore, um, he went to up to uh, Canada, where he did his residency at McGill University, and then joined the uh, University of Vermont College of Medicine faculty in 1984. Uh, he has me beat by two years. And one of the few faculty that <laughs> has longer to stay at UVM than uh, than I do, but I can remember um, knowing Phil from you know way back when, and. Um, Immediately upon joining the UVM faculty, Phil established the Cardiac Rehabilitation and Preventive Cardiology Service as part of the College of Medicine uh, Services. And it's a life-saving and cost-effective secondary intervention for patients who have had a recent cardiac event. And Phil uh, established that here, but he pioneer pioneered the intervention nationally and internationally, and it's now widely used and and, and um, appropriately so. Um, Phil has had an outstanding career in academic medicine, receiving numerous NIH R01 research awards, publishing more than 250 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, many in high-impact journals, including a very prestigious review in the New England Journal of Medicine. He has received, uh, as you might expect, numerous national and university awards for scholarship and mentoring. And I tr truly believe um, it fills an ideal role model for any young physician who seeks a rewarding career in academic medicine. Um, he's just an excellent clinician. He's a scholar, as I've been underscoring, and really an all-around caring and humble uh, physician and, and professional. So it's it's a pleasure to have him with us today. I, I appreciate it, Phil, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh... We can now take questions. <laughs> okay, no, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, and I hate to say it, that despite all my motivations to be a good cardiologist and a good researcher, uh, every day at work, my main, <laughs> I hate to admit this, my main motivation was when am I gonna go running and when is there time? Because I have to schedule that above all, but anyway. So today, the, the topic that I chose, uh, exercise and aging, is, is a very broad topic. So of course, I had to make some uh, selections as to what sort of things I'm going to cover. 
Uh, and here's a rough outline. So we'll look at effects of aging on exercise capacity, looking both at aerobic capacity and strength. Those are the two aspects of exercise that I'm gonna focus on. Then we'll have a segment on medical benefits of exercise, in particular prevention and treatment of uh, heart disease and diabetes. Uh, then we'll talk about the benefits of exercise and fitness. They're not the same in clinical populations. Then I'll focus in on an individual. So if an individual wants to start an exercise program, what are little behavioral things that they want to do? This is the, the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. So I'm going to try and focus on behavior a bit. Talk a little bit about obesity in America, because unfortunately that now comes with aging. And then finish up with a couple of myths and lead hopefully to a, a good session of questions and answers. Uh, I want to start off by defining things. Fitness and physical activity are not the same thing. Fitness is partly genetic. Actually, aerobic fitness is inherited a little more from your mother's side than your father's side. And it's measured by how far you go on an exercise test. Physical activity is behavioral and requires motivation and commitment often measured with questionnaires. A lot of the studies I'll show you today used questionnaires. And if you have a really good study, you have activity monitors. Uh, it takes more effort and time and expense. Uh, so you contrast uh, what people say with what people actually do. And they are obviously linked, that increasing your physical activity will increase your fitness, whether it be aerobic fitness or strength. And here is uh, recommendations for fitness from the CDC. Uh, this goes for older individuals. Uh, for aerobic exercise, they want you to do 150 minutes of at least moderate exercise, like walking, cycling, or gardening. gardening so that's 150 minutes. Or if it's more vigorous exercise, you get more credit. So you could do 60 minutes of more uh, vigorous exercise, something that will make you sweat. and increase your heart rate and so forth. So these are both a definition of aerobic exercise, but recommendations from the CDC. Now here is a slide. Ooh, it's a shame, but I'll come back to this. You can't see on this. Can you see yellow here at the bottom? Unfortunately, the bottom graph here is in yellow and you can't see it. So here I have just an active, healthy men and women, you could see the very important effect of aging on fitness. These are from a stress lab from Dr. Robert Bruce in Seattle, who sort of invented the clinical exercise test. So he had thousands of people in his database, and you could see that uh, women are less fit than men at every age, although as you get older, they approach each other. And obviously a very powerful effect of aging. And you can't see it on this graph, but when you take a clinical population like a cardiac population, um, it's about 40% lower than uh, healthy populations. Um, and on the y-axis here, mean peak VO2, that's the single best measure of fitness, peak aerobic capacity. Uh, so how much oxygen you could use with exercise, again, the single best measure of aerobic capacity. Okay, there we go, I was missing that. So this shows a comparison with a clinical population, men and women entering cardiac rehab to a healthy population. And again, the clinical population is about 40% lower on average than a healthy population. And in both, both cases, you can see the very, very powerful effect of age. Uh, and this 12.5, so when you look at women entering cardiac rehab, that literally qualifies you for a heart transplant. They are so unfit uh, after a cardiac event that it's not totally surprising because with fitness being a risk factor, you would expect a clinical population to have very low fitness, and that is the case. So the effects of age, gender, and disease. This is a very interesting study that I've always admired. 
uh, this is Dr. Jerry Flegg, and he used to run the Baltimore study on aging, Baltimore longitudinal study on aging. So they had men and women who were very carefully screened not to have heart disease, and they tested them uh, recurrently over a long period of time that approached uh, almost 30 years. And the very interesting thing they had is within each decade, they would have people would get tested twice. So you would actually have a slope for each decade. And this shows how people peak their fitness at around age 30. And then the slope is increasing and increasing. And, and this, by age 75, this slope is significantly greater than all the other slopes. So it shows that not only are we getting uh, less fit as we get older, but roughly around age 75, it takes a sharper dive and people really seem to get old. And, and I remember I read this in 2005, we were very impressed. It was a really a, a landmark study and it caused me to pay attention. And I really looked around and both in clinical populations and amongst people I knew, 75 within you know a bell-shaped curve. Uh, in many cases, people start to look <laughs> and feel older. So it is interesting how it's generally dropping, but then takes it, uh, the slope increases further at age 75. And these again are healthy individuals. In terms of how Americans are doing, in terms of the prevalence of uh, getting regular aerobic exercise in the US, if you do, if you do, if you measure physical activity by questionnaire, about 45% meet the phys physical activity threshold, which again, if you remember, is 150 minutes a week of moderate activity. And 55% don't get enough exercise and are at risk of heart disease. And lack of exercise is second to obesity as the most prevalent cardiac risk factor. And 25% get no leisure time activity whatsoever. This is measured by questionnaire. If you measure this by physical activity monitor, like an accelerometer, the numbers are much lower. And when you really measure it, rather than ask people, it's about 20 to 25% meet the physical activity threshold and 75% plus don't. So despite that we here at the medical center seem to be surrounded by people who exercise, when you really look at America on, on, at large, uh, that's not the case. And the vast majority of people uh, don't meet physical activity thresholds and, and most don't even go for, for a walk every day. And here's some of the reasons that are related to low physical activity rates. A lot of these are well-known, automobile, computers, remote control, you don't even, when you go for fast food, you don't even get out of the car and walk into place. You drive in and get your food. You don't, you don't expend a calorie to get your high calorie food. Or you walk down Shelburne Road and there's barely a place to walk. And very often I'll ask a patient, what do you do for exercise? And year round, people seem to want to tell me that they mow their lawn. And then when I ask them more about mowing their lawn, they usually have a ride lawn mower. And then I ask them if they have a drink holder and they, they put their beer can in their drink holder. So even mowing the lawn, a lot of people don't get many calories. Um, very few people now do physical work. I think it's something like 10 to 15% of Americans now do physical work. So a lot of people get tired at work, but that's not the same as, as doing exercise. And Zoom, this very lecture we're giving today, uh, for various reasons, we did not take the time to walk over to the lecture hall, and many of us could watch the lecture uh, in, in the comfort of our homes. And then I just comment that very, very few people get adder exercise at work. Farmers, uh, maybe construction workers. Uh, so for all, almost all people you'll see, uh, whether you're seeing patients or advising friends, Exercise needs to be added as purposeful exercise. You need to add something you do every day as your exercise. Very, very few people get exercise just going through their day. Okay, 
So moving along, we want to now move on a little bit to the medical benefits of exercise. We've so far, well, actually, let's see here. Okay, so so far we've been talking about aerobic, aerobic exercise. We'll come back to uh, strength training. Now I want to talk a little bit about the medical benefits of exercise. This is a study by Joanne Manson, who actually sat in this chair and gave this lecture two, three years ago. She's a researcher down in Boston. And here I want to bring your attention. By the way, can you see this pointer on your screen? You yes, see a pointer over the graphic? Yep, we can see it. Great, okay. So this is the nurse health, nurse's health study. And to simplify what looks very complicated, I just want you to look at the top bar here. So these are smoke smokers. These are people who smoked. These are 72,000 postmenopausal women who are in the nurse's health study. And they got total physical activity by questionnaire. And here you can see that when you, sorry, look at the lowest quintile of physical activity, this is defined as one. It's very high rates of, phys, of, of cardiac events, including mortality. You go to the next level, one quintile up, graphic study after study after study shows that if you go from totally sedentary just to minimal, minim, minim, minimally physically active, going into that second quintile, that's where you get the biggest benefit medically. So while it's good to do more, and I'll always say more is better, in terms of medical benefits, if you're advising a patient, really what you want to do, you'll get your biggest bang is simply taking people going from no physical activity to just something like a 10 minute walk every day at a moderate pace. Uh, and more is better for those of you who are seriously into exercise. No medical benefits to my understanding have been discernible above running 20 to 25 miles a week. So it trickles down up to that level for, for further medical benefits. Beyond that, if you wanna run more, or cycle more or whatever, that's good. You're doing it cause you like it or you're doing it cause you race, but the medical benefits max out at about equivalent of 20 to 25 miles a week. But again, the point I wanna make from this study is that there's a medical benefit, so cardiac events and mortality. And a, th a thing you'll see again and again, but I'm not gonna show 20 slides, but going from sedentary to that first, to that second quintile is where you get the biggest bang for your bucks. So this is physical activity. Now I just wanna show one study on fitness. Again, remember that they're not the same. Fitness you measure on a stress test. So this shows uh, fitness as measured by low, moderate, and high. The black is uh, men and women. And again, you see the same thing, that when you drop off from low to moderate levels of fitness, that's where you get the biggest bang. And then you trickle along. If you really are fit, you get more benefit. But the biggest bang is going from nothing uh, to something. And this is a mortality of over 100,000 years. And both of these are in advanced age adults. You've probably seen this before, but what fits your schedule better? Exercising an hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? Okay, so won't have time to cover all the medical benefits of exercise, but we've covered that it prolongs life and prevents coronary heart disease. Behavioral benefits are very, very prominent. And in fact, when I ask someone who finished cardiac rehab what they noticed the most, they don't tell me my peak VO2 is higher or I had a better heart rate blood pressure response. They say I feel more vitality, more endurance, less fatigue, less depression. And again, I'm speaking to mostly behavioral people in the audience. And if someone shows up to a doctor's office with depression, what the physician's gonna do, psychiatrist or psychologist is ask themselves, well, does this person need a medication? And in essentially every case, you're gonna recommend exercise because it so clearly improves depression. And we've seen in our cardiac rehab program that depression scores 
regularly get better uh, with the exercise program. Exercise also prevents obesity. We'll spend a little time on that. Prevents type two diabetes. We'll spend a little time on that. Lowers blood pressure, improves lipid profile. Also lowers cancer rates, colon, breast, prostate, uh, less likely to occur in fit people. And with breast cancer, even after treatment, the women who uh, take on an exercise program after treatment have lower recurrence, recurrence rates. So that's really pretty remarkable uh, that it's not just cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Uh, how it helps is, is a bit complicated, but the mechanisms are, are being worked out. So a broad array of medical benefits. Okay, you want to move on a little bit to strength or resistance training. To define, it's the use of resistance to muscular contraction to build strength, endurance, and size of skeletal muscles. Here, this is from a review and shows peak strength, and this is knee extensors, so straightening out your leg. And you can see with age, strength decreases. This is in untrained men, like most of us. And what's interesting about strength and aging is that you start losing strength, and I'll show you muscle mass, at a much younger age than you think. So strength starts really, loss of strength starts really showing up both in men and women. There's not a big effect on menopause. Uh, at about age 40, and keeps on lowering until you get older and condition known as sarcopenia develops, where you have very low muscle mass and it affects your physical function. And I'll show you that muscle protein synthesis starts to lower itself at about 30, but it shows up clinically at about age 40. And strength trained men eventually age does rear its ugly head, but you can see that there's clearly a difference in strength as there should be, as you would expect, strength trained men compared to untrained men. The graphic in, in women would look exactly the same. And, two to three months of resistance training can increase strength by about 40%. So you can see a remarkable improvement in a relatively short time. And then also here, you can see the loss of strength is roughly 12% per decade. So pretty prominent, and it starts again by, by age 40. And this looks at muscle mass with aging. This is from a review, a person named Volpe and shows that muscle mass begins to decrease in your 40s. So by 40 or 50, you're seeing a real measurable decrease in muscle mass. Uh, again, it's termed sarcopenia. And muscle mass increases only, particularly as you get older, uh, it increases only with intensive and prolonged resistance training. So it's pretty hard as you get older to see a real marked in increase in muscle mass. On the other hand, Prevention of muscle loss, the expected loss, is much more readily achievable. So if I'm recommending strength training to either a heart patient or, or a healthy individual, my real goal is to maintain muscle mass and strength rather than have it decrease with age. And this study here is actually a study we did here at the University of Vermont uh, back in the 90s and showed decreased muscle protein synthesis started at age uh, in the 30s. It dropped in their 30s and then it did not continuously get lower and lower and lower. It dropped in its 30s and stayed lower. So, so the reason for the lower muscle mass is uh, decreased muscle protein synthesis, again, that starts at a remarkably young age, starts at age 30 and continues on until you get older. If you're thinking about strength, this is the most important slide of my talk. And the established benefits of strength training, increase strength and endurance, increase or at minimum maintain muscle mass. Also interesting is that muscles are a very, very active uh, metabolic organ. So if you increase muscle mass, you burn more calories at rest, it's called your resting metabolic rate. So one of the ways by which strength training helps you maintain a healthy weight is that you actually burn more calories at rest if you have a larger muscle mass. But again, it takes a good amount of strength training to do that. 
The importance of resistive training, in my opinion, and I think many people's opinion, increases as you age to maintain muscle mass and prevent disability. In terms of exercise in clinical populations, I'm gonna talk a little bit about coronary heart disease and diabetes. In coronary heart disease, as Steve mentioned in my introduction, I'm the director of cardiac rehabilitation, which is exercise for coronary patients. So it's basically how I make a living. And the benefits of exercise in cardiac patients have really been very, very well worked out uh, in a series of many randomized control trials. Uh, and, and, and it equated to roughly a 25 decrease mortality over three years. And these studies are patients that are entering with a mean age of 65 years. Also very important, and one of the big goals of cardiac rehab is to improve physical functioning. We want people after their heart condition to return or exceed their physical function, you know, the, the, the activities they could do in their daily activities. Uh, again, clinical benefits, you include lipid profiles. Uh, another benefit from meta-analyses is that people who do cardiac rehab have lower hospitalizations at one year. And again, as mentioned, exercise in cardiac patients, most of whom probably uh, almost 90% are overweight. So it assists with weight loss and diabetic control. So very clear benefits, extremely well worked out the benefits of exercise in cardiac patients. And again, here I wanna focus on the, the extremely low fitness levels uh, in cardiac patients entering cardiac rehab. These are men, and gets much, much lower as you approach your 60s and 70s. And once again, uh, women entering cardiac rehab by age 50 are pretty much at a level where they would qualify for a heart transplant. Uh, just remarkable. And as you get older, by the time you get to be 70 and 80, men and women approach each other. So while women are losing muscle mass at a rapid rate, so are men. And uh, getting extremely unfit uh, by, by the oldest age. Here's a brief picture of what our cardiac rehab program looks like. Um, lots of treadmills, and you can't see in this corner, lots of equipment for strength training. Okay. Exercise, the value of exercise for obesity and diabetes. Uh, again, an older population. This is a population that started in their late 50s, followed for several years. This is called the Diabetes Prevention Program, very large multi-center trial uh, where individuals in the intervention group did walking exercise, 10 pounds of weight loss, yielded a 50% decrease in the development of diab diabetes in middle-aged overweight individuals. Uh, so not only prevents diabetes, if you have diabetes, it minimizes the needs for, for medications. So very obviously, aerobic exercise has an important role in obesity prevention and diabetes prevention. This is a study I just love in terms of the role of physical activity in preventing obesity. Uh, this is a study done in a small Amish population in Pennsylvania. Uh, where they had no cars, no TV, no computers, mostly farmers, and they put activity monitors on several hundred individuals in this community. And they found that the Amish adults accomplished 18,400 steps per day, where average American is 6,000 steps per day. And compared to average America, where 67% are overweight, only 25% were overweight. And compared to average America, where 30% are obese, 0% of these Amish adults were obese. Just remarkable because they expended all these steps on a daily basis. And the Amish children accomplished 14,000 steps per day because they helped out on the farm, I guess. And uh, much lower over obesity levels again versus 16%, 1% were obese. And their diet was not remarkably healthy. It was a pre-World War II diet, but it's just 
Can physical activity prevent obesity? By, by all means, and again, occurs whether you're old or young. In terms of prescribing exercise uh, for an older individual, uh, to start exercise where they haven't, uh, the, the kind of behavioral things you want to recommend is to, to make a commitment, do something like buying shoes, uh, where you're saying, I, I don't want to waste my money and I'm going to buy these shoes and establish protected time. If you're at work, just tell your office assistant, I don't do meetings from one to two because that's when I go for my walk or whatever. Develop a habit, set up small goals. Don't set up goals that you're not going to attain. Think long term, address barriers and get a partner. Can't tell you how many times I might have gone out for a run because I set up with a friend to meet where otherwise you might say, I don't feel so good. So it's, you know, starting an exercise program is clearly a behavioral thing to start it and to maintain it. In terms of prescribing exercise, this uh, mnemonic FIT, F-I-T-T, -T, frequency, intensity, time, type. So generally aerobic exercise, you'd recommend three to five days a week. Generally moderate level, time might be 20 to 30 minutes. Start with less, but you eventually want to get up to 150 minutes a week. And aerobic exercise, use large muscle groups like, like walking, jogging, biking, swimming, and so forth. That's fit for fitness. If you want to do fit for weight loss, you want to lose more pounds, you want to burn more calories, so you want to exercise just about every day, and you want to go further. So you don't have to go faster. In fact, you go less far, but you initially start at 20, 30 minutes. You want to get up to, a, to, a, to an hour per day. You, you can lose weight with exercise, but it, it takes a lot of time. Um, but just making the point that different goals require different exercise prescriptions. Who needs a doctor's visit before they exercise? Again, we're thinking of older individuals. Generally not necessary to start a walking program. We, walk, we don't want to place this as a barrier. So people are already walking around their house. If you're just saying, well, I want you to start walking outdoors 10 minutes a day, three days a week, you don't need a doctor's visit. Uh, only if you have a heart condition, you have lots of risk factors, like you're a smoker, you have diabetes, you have high cholesterol, you get chest pain when you exercise, you have bone or joint pains. But in most cases, you can start people exercising with a walking program. Definitely don't need to see a doctor. Resistance training is a little different than walking. Often you need some advice, uh, which is a little different than walking. So uh, frequency, we generally do two times a week. Intensity, we have a thing called a one repetition max. How much can you lift with a single strong lift? And then we'll start people at about 50% of what they could do once. You'll do one or two sets. I'll get into going to show a study where we did strength training. I'll show you what kind of exercise. And where you do it doesn't matter. Weight is weight. But machines are safer because you're not going to dro drop stuff on your toes. And generally requires a health club and best off to get instruction before you start. So it's a little harder to start strength training because uh, you need specialized equipment and instruction. And if you need an older individual to have a reference, these uh, books by uh, Miriam Nelson, who is a UVM grad. Uh, she's at Tufts and started this program called Strong Women, but it relates to men as well. That's very good advice on older individuals starting uh, strength training. Here, I want to show a study that we did uh, on the value of strength training in older women. And uh, we assessed the value of six months of strength training and the primary outcomes were performance of daily activities. So these were all women over age 65, all with heart disease, and all measured out on a questionnaire as having difficulties in performing daily activities. Um, we emphasized leg and shoulder strength, which I'll say for the people who are randomized to exercise, it increased by 40%. So here was the, the, the design of the study. It was a randomized controlled trial, resistance training versus the control group. 
And the control group, since you want them to spend the same amount of time with activity advisors, did light yoga and breathing exercises. And lo and behold, they actually got a little stronger in their legs, but what can you say? Uh, the study population, again, women over 65, definite coronary disease, had not been hospitalized recently, scored low on a physical function score, so qualified, according to the Framingham Disability Study, to be quote-unquote disabled, and they were not currently in an exercise program. The resistance training that was recommended, and they did it on site, so we advised them and watched them do this, uh, the, the women re who are randomized to resistance training, did exercise uh, strength training three times a week. They started at 50% of a single repetition max and we gradually increased them up to higher weights, 80% of their single repetition max. Again, single repetition max is how much you could lift just once. Um, so you might have someone with a bench press, you look them over, they say, oh, it looks like they might do 40 pounds. You have them do 40 pounds, they do it. Max, and we use that to uh, prescribe exercise. And the seven exercises the women did, leg extension, bench press, biceps curl, shoulder press, lat pull down, leg curl, leg press. And the control group did non-strength yoga and breathing and stretching. The primary outcome, so really our goal in this study was to translate physiology into fun function. We have this uh, physical function, physical performance test called the Continuous Scale Physical, physical Functional Performance Test. I had people do 15 activities and we had the Clinical Research Center, we had a room set up to do all these activities. And each of these activities, whether they were light, medium or heavy, you either measure the speed at which they did something or the amount they carried or a combination. So a heavy activity would be they had to carry a canvas bag filled with weights that were simulating groceries over a 10 meter walking course. Um, and so they would load up the bag. They say, I think I could carry this much. And we would measure both the speed and how much they carry. We would also have them do other, sorry, activities. We had a washer and dryer with a standard amount of uh, laundry that they would empty the washer, put it on a counter, load the dryer, we would measure the time. We would simulate getting up from the bathtub, opening a very heavy fire door, walking up a flight of stairs. Uh, you could see all these activities. Um, and the key was that these were activities that a, an older individual, be it a man or a woman, would need to do to roughly simulate being independent at home. We built a bus stop. It was really kind of fun doing this. Okay. And then comparing uh, the women in the intervention group to the control group, the total physical performance store score improved by 24%. Everything that has an asterisk improves significantly more in the women who are doing strength training. Again, the average age was in their lowest 70s. So obviously things that involved upper body strength and lower body strength were improved, but we were surprised. But again, as you learn more about strength training, that balance and coordination also improved significantly more with the women who did strength training, as did endurance, as did six minute walk. So there were all these domains. Uh, flexibility uh, improved similarly in the two groups, but everything else increased strength translated into improved ability to do all these activities that simulate uh, being uh, independent at home. So the findings, let me see here. Yeah. Uh, after conditioning 13 of 16 standardized household activities like dressing, kitchen work, cleaning, groceries were performed more rapidly or with increased weight versus controls. And the maximal power, so power in, involves speed. So maximal power for weight-bearing activities increased by over oh, 40%. And I remember when we first submitted this to the journal, I expressed uh, power in horsepower, because I just love the, the image of these 
women representing uh, strong horses, but they made us switch it to jewels or whatever it was, but we tried. So conclusions, resistance training results in a substantial improvement in multiple domains of measured physical performance in older women with coronary heart disease. So absolutely should be considered for older women, whether they have heart disease or not. Uh, and, and similarly, older men also have significant sarcopenia. So it really makes the case that strength training is very, very important to prevent disability in older men and women, whether or not they have heart disease, I would say. Talk just a little bit about obesity. Obesity relates to uh, energy in, food, energy out, um, includes resting metabolic rate, but the thing you can control is physical activity. And then you ask the question, do people get overweight because they eat too much or too, too uh, physically inactive? Also want to make the case that when you have a net amount of energy out or in of 3,500 kilocalories, that's about a pound or a half a kilogram. So if you, over a week, take in 3,500 kilocalories more and you keep your physical activity steady, you're going to gain a pound. And again, physical activity goes the other direction. Can you lose weight with exercise alone? Because today's talk is not about obesity, it's about exercise. I would say a qualified yes, but not so easy. Uh, we did a series of studies. I'll just show the first study, which was the simplest. We had heart patients do low intensity of exercise, but increased to 45 minutes a day, five to seven days a week over four months. We had them burn about 2,500 kilocalories per week, which is roughly 18 miles per week walking. So it's not that little. And again, one mile burns about 100 kilocalories. The good thing about being overweight, if you're 20% overweight, you burn 120 kilocalories. The one good thing about being overweight. Um, and over four months, these uh, heart patients lost about 11 pounds, um, improved their cholesterol profiles. So you can lose weight with exercise, but it's slow, takes time. Uh, the big thing about exercise and weight loss, really the key aspect of, of exercise is that it be a, be a component combined with a hypocaloric diet, but it turns out exercise is the key factor that keeps people from regaining weight. So this is an issue for older individuals, but not a primary issue. But in summary then, for my entire talk, uh, getting towards the end here, regular aerobic exercise is preventive and leads to a longer disease-free life. Strength training is important, particularly as you get older to prevent disability. And finally, obesity is as much due to underactivity as it is to overeating. And remember that slide on the Amish uh, individuals that if you burn a lot of calories in daily activities, you don't get obese. And finally, just wanna go over a few myths related to exercise and aging. First one is a funny one. I only get so many heartbeats in a lifetime I don't want to waste them exercising. Let's go to the next slide. Well, it turns out if you exercise, you actually save heartbeats. If you run an hour a day, you increase your heart rate by 60 beats a minute for about an hour. So in an hour, you add 3,600 heartbeats to your day. But if you're a regular exerciser, you're going to decrease your resting pulse by about 10 beats a minute for the remaining 23 hours. So you save 13,000 beats with your slower pulse. So a runner actually has about 10,000 fewer heartbeats per day rather than more because you're saving heartbeats the rest of the day. So just get ready when people say, why are you doing all this running? You're wasting your time. You're wasting heartbeats. You're saving heartbeats. To get the most out of exercise, I need to join a gym. Uh, I like to make the point that you don't need to join a gym, but I do make the case that for an older individual to start strength training, it really, really does help to have an exercise physiologist or a physical therapist to show you uh, proper technique with strength training and to guide you how to advance and which exercises to do. Um, subsequently, you could do it at a gym or at home. Uh, you could work it out at home with just a couple of uh, dumbbells, you know, free dumbbells, but it's also a little safer to use equipment that's handed, 
that's on a machine because it won't drop on your toes. Uh, but to get out and do a walk 10 minutes a day, by all means, you don't need it to join a gym. Exercise is only beneficial if you do it for a half hour a day. Turns out it doesn't matter how you do exercise, whether you do three times 10 or all at once, uh, you get the same benefit and studies have shown this. And again, to get out of that lower quintile, mostly you need to do is get out 10 minutes a day to get into that sec second quintile of physical activity to get the medical benefit. If I stop exercising, muscle turns into fat. Well, no. If you stop exercising, your muscles do get smaller. And if your equation of calories in versus calories out, you're burning fewer calories than you're taking in, you're going to gain fat. But the muscle per se doesn't turn into fat. They're separate, independent. The key to keeping a flat stomach and having a six pack is lots of sit-ups. Well, turns out the key is to be really skinny, to have very little subcutaneous uh, fat and doing exercises that build up your abdominal muscles. So uh, will help <laughs> with the six pack, but that's generally not a goal for our older patients. Exercise is the best way to lose weight quickly. I would say no, exercise is, is a good way to lose weight slowly. And it's a key thing to keep you from regaining weight, but cutting down on calories in your diet, if you can maintain that long-term is the best way to lose weight quickly. But maintaining it, exercise is absolutely key. I'm naturally thin, so I don't need to exercise. Well, no, a lot of the benefits of exercise have nothing to do with whether you're thin or not. Uh, they, have, they have to do with the effect of exercise on your, your, your heartbeat and, and on cardiac risk factors and so forth. I should be short of breath and sweating to benefit from exercise. Well, no, you get lots of benefit from moderate exercise. If I start weight training, I'll gain weight, get bulky. Take my word, none of the 60 women or 30 women who did exercise in our study got bulky. Um, I'm still waiting to see that. You know, the bulky tends to be younger people. Um, age does have a big effect on your ability literally to build up muscle. It's much harder to quote unquote get bulky as you get older, but you do tone your muscles and they get stronger by, by all means. Weight training is more important for younger people. Well, I'll say the opposite. No, it's more important for older people to prevent disability. And I'm too busy. I love that one. Barack Obama wasn't too busy. George Bush wasn't too busy. Melinda Estes, I don't know if you remember, Mindy Estes was the, the CEO of our, of our hospital system a few years back. I asked her, how do you find time to exercise? Because I know she was at meetings from 8 a.m. till 7 p.m. She got up at 5 p.m., 5 a.m. in the morning and walked on her treadmill. If you're committed and if you're motivated, you will absolutely find the time. Committed and motivated. Finally, another thing about aging, uh, you do have to think about unpleasant things, your living will. Telling his partner, just so you know, I never want to live in a vegetative state dependent on some machine. If that ever happens, just unplug me. Oh, she's unplugging. In the interest of time, I didn't discuss flexibility. I didn't discuss coordination. And there's lots of exercises and uh, physical therapists can help you and so forth for, for these things. They're, they're similarly important, but I, in the interest of time, such a broad topic, I focused on aerobic and strength training. Thank you very much and hope we're good. Time for questions and so forth. Thank you. All right, Phil, thanks for really uh, a terrific talk. Um, I learned a lot and very helpful stuff. So we have three questions waiting for you. Um, the first one, several studies show that fear of falling is associated with lower levels of physical activity in older adults. Do you have any thoughts on effectiveness or feasibility of fall prevention programs? Yeah, um, without question, uh, that is a big factor for older individuals or people who have some medical issues like neuropathy, uh, various reasons, if you have diabetes, you have bad balance and so forth. And in a matter of a second, the fall can uh, ruin a person's life. So fear of falling is sometimes appropriate. And I think that makes the case if falling and balance and coordination are a big issue, 
I would start with a physical therapist. If it's a minor issue, but you're worried about it, I think then the issue is just to start slowly. Um, that if there's no specific medical contraindication, uh, start with uh, slow walking. And maybe if there's a real feel of fall falling, start your first few weeks uh, with a partner as you start your walking. Um, recent years, I've had some medical problems myself, and it's a, it's a major issue that I'm just so careful not to fall, because again, I know in a matter of a second, it can uh, make a big, horrible effect on your lifestyle. Yeah. So I think that's a good point. And if balance and coordination are significantly uh, enough affected, one should start with a physical therapist, get a referral. Excellent. Another uh, question, uh, an observation in the form of a question. Uh, wouldn't it make more sense to prioritize strength training earlier when building muscle is easier so it can be preserved for longer? I think that's a good point. And that if a person uh, has the time and the ability and the motivation, you can make the case to start strength training, strength training at a younger age when it's easier to build mass. Uh, in a perfect world, I would say that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, okay. I would agree. Um, another one, my Fitbit shows how many calories I burn and motivates me to get uh, more steps slash exercise. Are there any studies showing that using a Fitbit helps older adults to stick with an exercise routine? Uh, yes, there are. It depends partially on, on personality type. And I would say in many cases, uh, a step counter is, is a great uh, goal. Um, I do that a lot with patients. And it's surprising how many people have an iPhone and don't know that the, the health thing with a little heart has a built-in step counter in it. And sometimes I'll ask people if they uh, carry their phone everywhere they go, because if they do, I'll say, can I, please hand me your phone and I'll look up and you could get an honest look at the steps that they're doing. And it's often remarkably low, but yeah, I find those things motivational. The only thing I'd say in terms of steps, they're extremely accurate. Uh, in terms of a calorie burning, they make a number of assumptions and um, they would have you put in your body weight, but to really uh, count calories well, you really want to have an estimation of body fat and, bo and muscle mass. So they have some proprietary equations that sort of help them get at that. Mm -hmm. I would say they're less accurate for burning calories than they are for step counts. But yeah, I find those things very motivational. It depends on the personality type. I think for most of us watching this lecture, PhDs and MDs, we are of the type that are motivated by grades <laughs> and uh, goals and so forth. Yeah. Another um, begins with a uh, compliment, great talk. What kinds of interventions have been successful in leading to sustained uh, parens over one year, aerobic exercise and strength training? So what kind of mention, interventions have led to sustained? Yeah, successful, sustained, over one year aerobic exercise and strength training? Yeah, good question. The nature of how we do studies um, does not lend itself to training studies longer than a year or two. Yeah. Lots of data shows that people, you know, the data I was showing from Joanne Manson, you get information from questionnaires that people who exercise long-term uh, have greater medical benefits. Um, that's a good question. I don't know that I, I have the answer to that. Um, if, you, if you're getting positive feedback from multiple directions, whether it be your, your partner, your friends, your physician, your whatever, that you're looking fit, <laughs> you know, I, I think that helps. But uh, the nature of, of us getting R01s and studies is that they're not eight years long, they're not 10 years long. And, and that's a good question <clears throat> of what are the interventions that maintain it long term? And I wish I could just open this up to the whole room and I bet some people might have a better answer than myself. 
uh, commitment. Uh, but I, I uh, keeping records, I found for myself, keeping records really, really helped. And I would have a goal of running a certain number of miles per week. But yeah. beyond that, yeah. Okay. Phil, are you aware of strategies for encouraging physical activity after graduation from a cardiac rehab, particularly for older patients? Wondering if there are easy to use apps that might help encourage people to keep up the activity. I know folks who have done great in cardiac rehab, but then get lost afterwards. Excellent question. Um, we've thought about that a lot. One interesting thing is that the benefits of cardiac rehab amazingly don't seem to de depend if you continue exercise long-term or not. If you do this three to four month bout of exercise and all the cardiac rehab stuff that comes with it, you get a medical benefit. Nonetheless, I don't have the slightest doubt that people who exercise long-term do better. In our hands, um, People who stay in our phase three program, I'm just sorry to say, people who stay on site continue to do it. They get great support from their, their, their exercise colleagues. When one of them is sick, they all go visit them and get this camaraderie. It's just a great thing. Uh, I'm sure there are apps. And again, I don't know of a single one that I'd recommend. Um, the best teaching apps I know come out of the University of Toronto, and we're actually going to have the person who developed those apps as a speaker next month here at the BCBH. Um, but I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know a single app that itself fills in the role that our phase three long-term, $40 a month, if you're on Medicaid, $20 a month uh, program. They do great. Uh, some keep it up, but the, the majority don't, which is a frustration. Yeah. yeah. Well, Phil, maybe you could say a little bit more about that uh, phase three. I didn't know about that. Um, oh, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Phase three cardiac rehab uh, is a program are mostly comprised of people who finished phase two. And they're people who just like coming to cardiac rehab. They feel safe there. And I could understand okay. that because there's cardiologists around and exercise physiologists and nurses and physical therapists. And it's a safe place to exercise. And again, they develop this camaraderie with other heart patients. And uh, we're open uh, six days a week. So we're also open Saturday morning. And it's an out of the pocket compared to medical stuff. <laughs> we are nothing on this. It's just amazing what medical prices are, but people pay $40 a month and if they were in cardiac rehab on Medicaid, they immediately qualify for a cost reduction to $20 a month. And all we want to do is cover our costs um, of a staff member. We always have a staff member who's there. Uh, and they continue their treadmill walking and their whatever. And these patients just do remarkably well. Other places have done studies of patients who stay on in phase three and they do very, very well. We've not done studies. It's very selective. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely not randomized. The people who do phase three are very motivated to stay on and do what they've been taught to do, but they do remarkably well and a relatively low cost, safe place to exercise. Yeah, mm -hmm. call phase three. Maybe a, for a final question, um, for older adults, particularly women, it sounds like weight training may be recommended more for strength training over other resistance activities like swimming or rowing machine. Is this correct? Um, I guess the way I would make the comparison is weight training is a little more comprehensive in terms of the muscle groups that it works. Um, but some things like rowing uh, works arms and legs. Uh, I hate to choose one or, or the other, but again, weight training, if you select a good six or seven exercises, a little more comprehensive for total body. Uh, rowing has the added uh, advantage of being both aerobic and, and strength. So it covers both there. Um, but older women, if I had to focus on one thing, I'd say strength training, but I hate to make these decisions. I would always say, why not do both mm -hmm. if they're accessible? 
Great. But the thing that's most accessible, which I just love recommending, is walking and strength training. So if I had to recommend two things, I'd say strength training and get out for a walk. Terrific, Phil. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to share this information. It's, uh, you know, obviously very scholarly, but also very practical and useful and timely for many of us. So thanks very much. And thanks to everyone in the audience for being such a good, a good out audience. And that wraps it up for today. Uh, we'll see you a month from now. Thanks. Bye-bye.